carried away. The females play hard to get, making sure only the fittest males will carry on the primordial legacy. Some win, others lose. Decorations aren't necessarily an advantage. The size of a hubcap, the female is shielded by the seagrass. But sooner or later, she must face the hordes. In the end, she succumbs to the sheer weight of numbers. The mating ritual soon resembles a wrestling match. Bodies are flipped in the stampede and tormented by the tide. Once a suitor manages to catch up, he latches onto her. Specially modified front legs lock in, and there he'll stay for days. More males cluster round, trying to climb aboard. They trail behind, hoping to displace the leader. Jousting with his Telson, the male asserts his dominance. The mating urge is so strong, he won't let go, whatever happens. They curl their bodies, trying to keep their book gills covered. Trying to do a Telson maneuver with a living backpack proves impossible. Horseshoes practice very safe sex. There's lots of close body contact, but no actual penetration. Our large female drags her firmly attached male through the waves towards the beach. Once in the shallows, she'll scrape out the simplest of nests a 15 centimeter pit. She lays anything from 10 to 20,000 eggs released from pores under her gills. She fans them across the pit. The male pumps out his sperm. Waves following under the female shell suck sperm with them so that it can settle on the sticky eggs. The eggs need all the help they can get. The mating ritual is a dinner bell to others on the shore. But nothing distracts our lovers. Except other horseshoe crabs. Unattached males pump their own contribution around the copulating pair, hoping a few of their sperm might penetrate an egg. We have so many thousands of spawners that it's not uncommon to see 10 or 15 males all around one single female. So all of them are actually releasing their sperm and fertilizing the same eggs. This mass mating only happens in spring when a full or new moon is combined with a high tide. The crucial ingredients for this crabby spectacle. This is one of my favorite beaches to walk on. It's Pickering Beach in Delaware, probably the world's most productive spawning beach for horseshoe crabs. But it's a short-lived orgy. Once the adults' work is done, they retreat to the depths, leaving their legacy in the sand. Their offspring will have to manage on their own, 
and predators lurk round every corner. The eggs of the horseshoe crab are about the same size as grains of sand. The sticky packets of protein contain everything needed to build the next generation. But very few will make it. It's always been like this. It's the Jurassic period. In the same ritual, crabs gather on the shoreline ready to breed, and they too find themselves under attack. Pterosaurs have mastered the skies. Armed with a spiny beak full of teeth, it's likely the Ramphorhynchus would flock to excavate their newly laid eggs. Today's scavengers are different, but just as grateful for the feast. We've had horseshoe crabs spawning on beaches 100,000 years before birds as we know them ever needed their eggs for fuel, before the dinosaurs, and of course, after the dinosaurs. When we go back through time, we can almost connect horseshoe crabs in every stage. That's a pretty remarkable thread to follow. By the time modern birds appeared on Earth, the horseshoe crabs had already been around for 300 million years. Migrating shorebirds that are coming from South America en route to the, their Arctic breeding grounds use the Delaware Bay as a, as a vital refueling stop, uh, primarily because of the horseshoe crabs and the horseshoe crab eggs that are in abundance during that time of year. The eggs are kind of like eating Big Macs. They're high in fat, so a bird might come in severely underweight and within 10 or 15 days bulk up and have enough fuel to make the next part of its journey up to the Arctic. Up to a million shorebirds stop off here to refuel, all hoping to end up supersized for the next leg. For the endangered red knot, it's a vital lifeline. The famished birds will eat at least one egg every five seconds, anything from nine to 23,000 eggs a day. After two or three weeks, the birds continue their epic journeys north. The beaches fall silent. Some of the eggs, well hidden in the sand, escaped the probing beaks and now have a chance to grow. And so it has been for hundreds of millions of years. But times are changing. An abduction. Loaded into a box with thousands of her kind, our female begins a journey into an alien world. Huge needles, dripping tubes, sterile surfaces. Around half a million crabs are taken to laboratories every year. And there, they give up their very precious blue blood. I work in the pharmaceutical industry we use horseshoe crab blood every day to test the products that we make. But it's really a good thing. Horseshoe crab blood protects these products from a contaminant that can give people fevers. We put a lot of things into our bodies. We put a lot of medicines into our bodies. And of course, we want those things to be safe as well as effective. In the 1960s, when space travel and aliens were all the rage, an American scientist discovered otherworldly traits right here on Earth. He found that the crab's copper-rich blue blood evolved to withstand the bacteria-ridden ancient seas, 
had unique properties. Its white blood cells are highly sensitive. When the blood detects bacteria, the white blood cells coagulate, gelling around the infection, making it harmless. This clotting is very quick. In less than an hour, the presence of bacteria can be clearly confirmed. You say, well, why can't we test our pharmaceutical products, our medicines, our medical devices with this horseshoe crab blood? And of course, that was a great idea. What makes that idea even better is that we don't kill the animal in order to do this. Instead, scientists drain around 30% of each creature's blood. Karen helps regulate the players in crab-based medical research. She knows the drill. You can see that there's a sinus that runs down the back of the horseshoe crab. And that sinus contains its heart. So when we go and extract the blood, essentially the horseshoe crab is folded up and that sinus is exposed and a needle is inserted and the blood flows from there. To keep our medicines safe, the horseshoes take an arrow to the heart. The blue blood is taken from the heart. 70% is left. A clot forms and the bleeding stops. Other vessels around the body start to replenish the blood, but it will take months to replace what's lost. Once blood is extracted, the different elements are separated. The white blood cells are made into lal. Any batch of medicine or any device that needs to be sterile is rinsed with distilled water. Lal is then added to the water. If it forms a gel, the sample is contaminated. This simple test has become the standard way of checking medicines. To me, the fact that you can use their blood is awesome. It's used in the medical field all the time. It protects people. Every man, woman, child, and domestic animal in the world that depend on medical services are reliant on a test made from the horseshoe crab blood. It's a lucrative business. Just two pints of blue blood will sell for $15,000, and the lull industry turns over more than $150 million each year. The blood is so sensitive, it can detect the bacterial equivalent of a grain of sugar in an Olympic swimming pool. It's even used in space. NASA scientists and engineers can screen their equipment to keep them free of contamination during their missions. Astronauts take their own portable devices to look for bacteria. The quick test takes just 15 minutes. The female has made it through. Her heart is scarred and she's a little low on blood, but she's alive. She'll be released back onto the beach, maybe with her own story of alien abduction. Karen doesn't see it that way. It's sort of like going to the Red Cross and getting a blood donation. We give it a donut, a glass of juice, and we say thank you for the blood donation. The mortality rate from intensive harvesting can be up to 15%. So this lull industry totals up to 40,000 deaths every year. Now, of course, there's a small mortality rate, but when you consider the benefits of what this blood does in terms of keeping the medical supply in this world safe for the consumers and patients, it's a very, very small trade-off, I think. Back in familiar surroundings, the female may feel a little weak. It will take a few months of low activity before she can replenish the lost blood. It is a little weird that this really ugly creature has this most magnificent blue blood. It's the most magnificent color. Um, and to the, to the patients of the world, it's, it's not blue, it's gold. 
it really is gold because it's helped so much. Well, horseshoe crabs protect people every single day. The blood of the horseshoe crab protects human blood and they help you essentially. They help in every way. They help humans in every way possible. And horseshoe crabs help other sea creatures. We want them to really appreciate uh, an organism that uh, you don't see every day, an organism that is amazingly resilient. Over 20 years ago, John realized that life-saving medicines are often found in animals, including horseshoe crabs. Well, my son was diagnosed with leukemia when uh, he was seven years old. He's a survivor. He's doing terrific. He's spectacular. Changed my whole life. It becomes more, more personal for me and uh, has really driven me in, in the last, certainly in the last decade. John Tanakridi is the director of Earth and Marine Sciences. His teaching is giving the Crab Club a boost. They are the perfect biological subjects for his students. They can have the animal right in their hands if they want to. From an educational standpoint, that's the greatest tool you can have. Oh, I get to hold them? The hands-on science may help their crabby classmates. We have seen a host of concerns and questions that come out, not so much from the biochemical companies, but from where the animals are harvested. In the past, Collected animals were simply released from the labs onto the most convenient beaches. They may be harvested in waters, let's say, taken from New York waters and released in Massachusetts or released in Rhode Island or Connecticut. But John Tanakridi's students are looking at crab genetics, making some interesting discoveries. I'm seeing if the horseshoe crabs come back every year based on their genetics and radio telemetry. So it's sort of like sea turtles. Like you know how sea turtles like go out to the beach and then they come right back in? Well, uh, with these horseshoe crabs, we're trying to see if they do the same thing. Being moved from the beaches where they were born could interfere with the crabs' breeding patterns. Contrary to like popular belief, they don't go out and intermingle and switch it up. They come back to their beach every year. My project was to focus on rare haplotypes, actually, of, of horseshoe crabs. Now, haplotypes are just genetic variabilities that are passed on from the mother to the baby horseshoe crabs. It's very important to see the genetic variability, only because any significant changes within the horseshoe crab is because of any stress that's being put onto the animal. The groundbreaking work will give the horseshoe crab a much-deserved helping hand. And nature is doing its bit as well. The female crab has gone back to sea, leaving her precious legacy deep in the sand. After two to four weeks, when the tide covers the shoreline, tiny horseshoes wriggle free of their eggs. Known affectionately as trilobites, for their first six days of life, they swim excitedly in the shallows. But this freedom is short-lived. Like the trilobites of old, horseshoes must shed their skins in order to grow. After the first molt, the baby's shape changes. The long body takes on the familiar horseshoe shape. The young creatures now walk on the sea floor. Molting is probably a stressful time for them. Once the old skin is shed, the new shell is soft, offering little protection. By the time they are ready to breed, at age nine, the males will have molted 16 times. Females have an extra molt and are not ready to breed until they are 11. Each time they molt, they completely regrow their lenses, something no other marine animal can do. Their lives are full of dangers. 
If they escape the birds, they will face fish, turtles, and people, all looking to exploit them. One study suggests that just 0.003% survive their first year, just 30 in every million. But for those lucky few, it can be a long life. They won't breed for at least 10 years and may live to 40. With such slow growth and so much predation, crab populations are at risk, but the Crab Club has plans. We started a captive breeding program for horseshoe crabs. It's a daunting task. Our goal is to put 10,000 horseshoe crab juveniles into Great South Bay on an annual basis. Some of the precious eggs from the spawning grounds have been collected to rear in the labs. Eggs from our female are included in the sample, safe from probing beaks and hungry mouths. Once hatched, the babies are kept in carefully controlled environments and fed with all they need to grow. After one year, they should be about five centimeters across. Then they will be released back into the wild with a much better chance of surviving. But the end game is to breed them in the labs. Already, several adult crabs have bred and thousands of eggs have been laid. But crabs are fussy and it's not always easy to get them in the mood. Diane observes the animals closely and regards them as individuals on a very personal level. 